Welcome to the Holy Smokes Podcast, a show about faith, friendship, fine tobacco and drink. I'm Steve Ryder in the lion's den and Kay Hidamine, the godfather of Holy Smokes, is back from his month of travels from the month of November into December, really. Mm. You were gone for a while. Yeah, I was in uh, Singapore, New Zealand, Australia, just, you know, propagating the message of Holy Smokes. Even Israel. Israel as well, yeah. where it truly is holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll want to catch up with you and talk about that trip and how things went and talk about some updates at a, in a future episode. But right now, we have the man that introduced me to you. That's Mr. right. Mr. Hidemine. It was five years ago in September, I want to say, and my buddy John Ramstead and I started a podcast called Eternal Leadership, and at that very first set of tapings where we interviewed, let's see, who do we interview on in that set? We interviewed Matt Hurd, we interviewed... C. Peter Wagner. C. Peter Wagner, who was an absolute gem. Amazing. And mm-hmm. then we also interviewed Amy Everett, who... That's right. As local prayer warrior and at the time had a uh, ministry of uh, pr- prayer for business. Intercessory prayer for business. Yeah. yeah. Those were our first three episodes. And we did them down in Colorado Springs at that coffee shop. Mission Unco- Coffee Roasters. Mission, Mission Coffee. Coffee Roasters in their little uh, upstairs. Uh, upstairs area. And yep. you and I got together for Mexican food because you don't get together with Kay without food involved. <laughs> True. True. So we broke tortillas. And eight. <laughs> there may have been some margaritas involved. There might have been. It was lunch, though. I had a drive. But anyway, that was so great because you were just, you've always just been so generous and you just helped us really think through like who would just be amazing. And our podcast just launched in just such a phenomenal way. And a big part of that was a lot of people you introduced us to. So yeah. thank you, my friend. Well, it's been a pleasure supporting you and I believe in you. I trust you. And I know you're going to be able to help so many people through. Not only your calling, but gifting, but also your ministry. Yeah, thank you. All right, so the first question we start every podcast with, what you smoking? Okay, what you got? I got a short little Padilla Maduro, which I'm going to light up here in a little while. And I'm looking forward to trying it out. John, what you got? What did Kay hand you? Kay handed me something, but unfortunately my... Eyes as they've aged. It's a very expensive cigar. It's a John. very expensive cigar. It says Kirkland. Uh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! Did I give you that one? <laughs> That's from the wrong box. <laughs> Which one is that? That's an H Upman. Ooh, very nice. Yeah. Which H Upman is that? Uh, Not the banker. Fumas. 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 Yeah. Ooh. A little spicy. Yeah. Nice. Let your mouth on fire. Nice. And then I've got a Casa Cuevas. Casa Cuevas. Casa Cuevas, Cuevas. which uh, Brandon from Cigar Mechanic gave me a handful of them to try out for the podcast when I met him on Friday in Ontario, Cal- or no, in uh, Corona, California, when I was over at Tim Long's place on the uh, Dad's Smoking Cigars podcast. Nice. Tim had me over at his house and... Uh, Brandon swung by after the conversation. We had another cigar. And uh, yeah, Brandon gave me a handful of Cuevas and a few others that that he uh, brokers. So, John, you are a Minnesota kid. Yep. Grew up in Burnsville, just south of Minneapolis. Yeah. Yep. So talk about growing up, what that was like. Well, it was interesting. Um, what kind of family you grew up with? Grew up, you know, always going to church. Uh, had to, We were kind of required to go. So I had some great friends in the youth group. My brother was a total wild child, totally got into smoking and drinking and drugs and all those kind of things. And so, and that was all part of the Burnsville High School. It was part of the whole, it was oh. one of the big kind of, it was not a good high school at the time. And that was our only option. Yeah. So my mom and dad, or my dad said, John, we're going to send you to St. Thomas Military Academy, mm. which is all boys, Catholic. I'm not Catholic. He goes, and if you don't like it after the first year, you know, well, maybe we'll, you know, we'll look back at going to Burnsville. Well, I hated it. 
Mm. It's not my deal. I had to wear a uniform every day. You know the junior ROTC things, mm -hmm. right? You had to shine your brass, your hair's cut, oh. inspections, marching, and I had to go to mass, and I knew nothing about the whole, I don't want to say anything disparaging about Catholicism. It, Catholicism, but there's just a lot that you learn growing up in that system about when to do things, what to say. I didn't know any of it, yeah. so I felt like a totally fish out of water. Yeah. So anyway, at the end of my first year, I told my dad, I'm like, I hate it here. I don't want to go here. And my dad said, well, I'm sorry. I was just kidding. <laughs> You're staying. <laughs> I'm staying. So I ended up graduating from St. Thomas Academy. And I never really thrived there. I did never really liked the kids. I didn't enjoy high school. Until about my senior year. Actually, my senior year, I decided, you know what? I'm going to... I'll never forget this. I was actually with... Uh, I just... The home environment was kind of negative with my dad. Or, I mean, with my brother constant arguing fighting yeah. my mom and dad had gotten divorced and then they actually mm. got remarried a year later and i remember when they told me that they were going to get remarried i was totally bummed out why when they told me they were getting divorced i was thrilled what just the angst this the, anybody who's grown up in a family like that mm -hmm. and here's what i knew when they told me they were going to get divorced because my dad was awesome he's still one of my best friends i was going to get to spend at least two weekends a month alone with my dad wherever he was going to go choose to live. And I, I was so excited. To this day, one of my big memories was when Star Wars came out. I was with my dad that weekend, and we walked from his apartment in Edina to Southdale and watched that movie together. And then we went shopping, and we bought... A, I remember we, I bought a little toy truck at like a toy store on the way back. And uh, that memory of with my dad is just seared in my head, right? Yeah. But through this, my own self-image, right, how I saw myself was so low. I'll never forget, we were at a youth group meeting, and one of the guys, the guy who led it, his name's Bart, and I came up to me. I'm sure I just said something to trigger him. He got up in my face. He's like, Ramstead, you are such a jerk. No wonder you don't have any friends. And he walked away. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. This is when I was a junior. Yeah. And I would, you know, when somebody does that and gives you feedback that you don't agree with, you just either reject it or somebody gives you feedback and you don't like it. And this is the case here. You have, you're forced to process it. Mm -hmm. And I realized, you know what? I got to start working on being a, a different person. So I actually went to my senior year in high school. I said, I'm going to just start showing up differently. Mm -hmm. Started having some more fun. Went out for football. I made vars the varsity football team the first time year I'd ever played. And so then, you didn't play football before? Nope. Never played ever. Any, and I went out. This, I went soccer. Okay. And I was not. I was average. So I quit soccer. Yeah. I swam. I was on the swim team. Went to States. But that was a, that's not really a team sport, right? Yeah. Where you're making good relationships. Yeah. But so then I went to college. And then wasn't really grounded. I just totally pulled the ripcord. And joined a fraternity. Became the social chairman. Set a record for the most kegs drinking at a party by any fraternity on campus that has still not been beaten, 43 kegs. Wow. Yeah, baby. You got to go big. You got to set goals. You know what I'm saying? What fraternity? <laughs> Delta Tau Delta. Delta Tau. At, at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Rensselaer. Uh, Rensselaer. It, yep, RPI. So that was just a great experience. It actually started showing me that I actually could have friends, start doing some big things. I enrolled in Navy ROTC. Yeah. And ended up getting uh, orders to go to flight school. So I ended up going right after the movie Top Gun came out. I went down to Pensacola. And that movie had an impact on you. I mean, like, like an impact that it had on lots of young men in the 80s and 90s. It did, but you know what? Uh, mine was probably opposite of what you might think. Really? So here's what happened is, right? I'm in the movie theater yeah. with my girlfriend watching this yeah i'm in rotc two years i'm about to go back and make my selection aviation which i'm watching on the screen submarines or surface and i'm watching maverick going and i've had this secret dream since i was a kid to be a fighter pilot and i'm watching this unfold on the screen i'm like nope that's not me i couldn't do it i will fail i will die I will embarrass myself if I try. Mm. 
So I even walked out of that movie theater, man. I was totally despondent. And then I went to a couple of my friends and said, hey, that movie came out. I'm in ROTC. I think I'm going to apply to aviation. My friends laughed. Like, dude, man, you're afraid of heights. I was afraid of heights since I was a little kid. What? Yeah. So here's what happened. Um, I was four years old. And we had just, my dad had just bought a new house. And it's still under construction. And I'm walking up, you know, the unfinished stairs and it's just the boards yeah. you can see down through them. Yeah. I'm halfway up the stairs, this little kid crawling up the stairs. I can see all the way down into the basement and I absolutely just freeze. I'm terrified. I feel like I'm going to do a header straight down into the basement. My dad starts encouraging me. Hey, you know, come on, John, come on up. And I literally started shaking. I couldn't move. He had to come down and carry me to the top. Yeah. So when I was in, uh, it's just amazing how little things just have this compounding effect. We don't even realize it. When I was in middle school and the house is finished and carpeted and everything all filled in, I would still, I was so, I had so much fear of those stairs. I would run up them two at a time and they're completely enclosed to get to my room that was upstairs. And we lived in a wooded area, just like we're in now. And all my friends loved to play and climb in the trees. And, and they'd invite me, and I wouldn't go up. And I was scared to death. I wouldn't go in the trees. I wouldn't go in a playhouse. I wouldn't go on a tire swing. And guess what? They stopped inviting me to play with them. Because I was boring. But what I saw was total rejection. And, and so this whole thing at yeah. St. Thomas, right? I was, I was really, I saw myself as somebody who wasn't worthy of having friends. And we also had all this angst in my family. I had no idea how to process any of this stuff. So when I made that decision to go, to start to make some changes my senior year, think about this. It's the end of my senior year in high school. And they announced that, hey, it's the class field trip or the class trip, senior class trip. Yeah. And it's to Taylor's Falls, Wisconsin to go cliff jumping. I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> no. Well, I couldn't not go. Yeah. So we get there. We're at the top of Taylor's Falls. You ever, you've, have you ever been there? No, I've never been okay. there. Okay. We're on the Wisconsin side. Yeah. It's a hundred foot cliff. And I won't even go. My fear is keeping me so far from that edge of this thing. I can barely kind of see the river down below. Yeah. And everybody's all daring each other, all these, you know, high school guys. And nobody will jump off. <laughs> so I look at my buddy, Larry. I go, Larry. I was totally joking. Larry dude, we should jump off. He goes, great idea. Grabs my wrist, drags me to the edge. And the next thing I know, I am weightless. <laughs> I am terrified. Oh my gosh. I am falling. Two and a half seconds later, I slam into the river at 53 miles an hour. Yeah. Because I've actually gone back and calculated did, did, did it. Because I'm an engineer. Did the math. <laughs> and it, what shattered though, in that moment was this belief that I actually couldn't make big choices. Really? That's when things honestly started to change. But when I watched that movie and I'm going back into ROTC, everything came back. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I'm going to fail. It was like being on top of that cliff and not wanting to jump. And there was nobody there to grab my wrist and pull me off the edge. Tell you to do it. So when I got back to college, yeah. I did not apply to aviation. Hmm. I applied to submarines. Hmm. And I, then I went and spent six weeks on a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, uh-oh. No offense to any submariners out there. Wasn't for me. I'm a big guy. But anyway, so think about this. What do you do, though, when you get to almost this Y in the road? You have a choice to either almost take the easy choice where you know that you'll succeed professionally, but you're going to not be happy. Or you have the other choices to bet on yourself not knowing what the outcome will be. Yeah. And a lot of us have been in places like that exact same moment. And I got to tell you, I didn't know, I had nobody to turn to, but I knew that if I didn't bet on myself, I would regret it the rest of my life. Yeah. And that's actually when I decided, you know what, I need to change all this. And I was able to apply for flight school and I got in. And when I got in, we were told only one out of every 10,000 people that applied back then because of the movie. I don't know if these numbers were true, but that's what we were told would end up flying a fighter. So I knew the chances were even slim to none yeah. that I could even fly a fighter. But I decided, you know what, I got to go for it. Mm -hmm. And that was a turning point, I think, in my whole mindset, how I viewed myself. Because I went down to flight school, ended up finding some incredible mentors that taught me how to do some things that they were doing. I ended up graduating number one and got to choose to fly the F-14. 
So I flew F-14s off aircraft carriers for the next seven years. That was a summary, very quick summary of what was going on during that time. But your dad gave you some incredible advice before you started flight school, if I remember right. Yeah. So think about this, right? You're heading down to flight school. You know, it's one out of every 10,000 people. Yeah. You know, the, I mean, it's one of the most dangerous places in the world to live and work. And my dad had been a combat air crewman in World War II, but he pulled me aside because he knew I was nervous. And the be- and I'm glad you brought this up. Some of the best advice I've ever had in my whole life. And he said, John, when you get down there, there's going to be a student that everybody's talking about, the ace of the base, and you need to find him, go buy him a beer, smoke a cigar with him. That would even be better. But just ask him what he's doing and then just do what he's doing to get the results that he has. I'm like, wow. So what he's telling me is to go seek mentorship, right? So I get down to Pensacola, and the guy everybody's talking about who's in our student was John Foster. And I met with John, and I said, hey, you know, what are you doing differently? He said, we just became great friends. He goes, John, here's what I believe. It's not the best pilots that graduate number one. It's the best students. And he goes, here's what you're going to do. He was very directive. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to take everything you have to know in that cockpit, every procedure, every emergency, every system, pressure, hydraulic, anything that they could ask you. And you're going to write it on a three by five card. He goes, do you know how to juggle? I said, I don't. He goes, well, you're going to teach yourself. And then you're going to sit there and juggle and you're going to be doing a physical activity and you're going to have people quiz you on those cards. And if you get one wrong, you're going to redo that whole section. Because if you can recall instantly in your head and be able to think ahead of the plane while you're doing a very complex maneuver in that environment, other planes flying in formation, he goes, you'll crush it. And that was one of the things he shared with me. But here's the funny thing is, you have this environment where everybody wants to graduate number one. That's what their stated goal is. And because the the environment was so... I think the seven years that I was in the Navy, I went to eight funerals, right? Those first couple funerals were pretty sobering because, you know, like this is, I'm still in training. Mm -hmm. So we all shared this information that would all help us out. Even though we knew that we're all competing with each other, it was this amazing environment. We were all competing, but we all helped each other. And I shared with everybody in my class what John was teaching me. And John would say, hey, meet me at the simulator building on Friday night instead of going out partying. And I'd invite everybody else. How many people do you think would show up? Zero. Zero. I'm like, you guys said you want to graduate number one? No, we'll get there. I was the only guy in my class who got jets. Mm. But see, that, that always surprised me about, that's something that was interesting, that when you share with people how to get the results, right? And it's not just my idea. This is stuff that's worked for other people to build a ministry, to start what you guys done with this movement with Holy Smokes and the mission behind that, what you've done with your company, Right Turn Media, Steve. A lot of us have ideas and we're living in this land of just mediocrity and we're frustrated. And the thing that I have always found curious is why people don't take the steps that they know would lead them to a better place. Mm-hmm. And I've been stuck there. You know, I, I don't want to sound like I'm causing judgment because I've definitely been stuck in some places in my life. But there is always a way forward. Where you can always have hope because we can always find somebody who's done what we want to do to levels that we don't even know if we could do ourselves who are willing to help us. I have never found a lack of mentorship ever since that day all the way forward. But yeah, that was some of the best advice my dad's ever given me. So you graduate from your class and you graduate? Graduated number one in the country. Number one in the country? Yeah, not, not just my class. That year, yeah. I was yeah. number one in the country. Yeah. Because of John's help. I mean, he pushed me. He would not let me. I mean, we had a lot of fun, but we had fun after the work was done. Yeah. Yeah. And then? So then I got orders to go fly the F-14. So I went to Virginia Beach and learned how to fly the, and fight the F-14 Landed on aircraft carriers, do aerial refueling, air combat, bombing, tactics, and then got sent straight to Japan on a carrier that was heading straight into the Persian Gulf for Desert Storm. Mm. So I was the most junior pilot in our air wing as we rolled into the Persian Gulf for Desert Storm. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got some stories from that time. 
I got some good ones and bad ones. I mean, uh, I don't know. I could share a couple with you. Yeah. How about the night I flew with a guy who then said, I don't ever want to fly with Ramstead ever again. <laughs> what that happened? would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so when combat first started, yeah. we were uh, all the rules, like normal you know, things go out the window, like you know, crew rest, all these kind of things. So this is going to tie into a cigar part of the story. So uh, help me out here if I forget. So here's what happened is I had, I think in about three days, what, 72 hours, I had slept maybe four or five hours. Ooh. I was flying one or two combat missions a day. And what we, every single flight, you have the go birds, the ones that are launching on the mission, you always have a spare. So let's say you're flying the, the lead airplane. If you're, if you're on the, the catapult and your airplane breaks, well, we, the squadron is responsible to have, let's say, two or four airplanes in there, so we always have a spare. I'm sitting there. I'm the spare. Now, this is this third day, and I'm in my cockpit. I'm the spare for a short flight. Our maintenance officer is in the, in the primary bird. It was just a one-ship mission to do combat air patrol over the boat and then 45 minutes later come in and land. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm on pure oxygen, and I'm sitting in the cockpit with the engines turning, doing this. I'm doing touch and goes, falling asleep, and then jerking my head back up. Mm -hmm. I'm so tired. Because I know that as soon as Wang was his call sign, uh, as soon as Wang gets launched off the front of the ship, I'm shutting this thing down. I'm going to bed. Mm -hmm. He gets up to the catapult, full hydraulic failure. And they walk over to my jet and they do this. They take this motion where they like wipe their uh, hand down their arm, uh, you know, left and right, yeah. left and right, which means unchain the jet and taxi them up to the catapult. I'm like, oh, crap. I don't even have any notes for the mission. I have no frequencies. I hope my backseater has them. Seriously, I was not prepared. And they launch me. And then they tell me to come up secure, a secure frequency, which means I'm being tasked to a, uh, an alpha strike. So instead of a 45 minute flight, I didn't get back to the boat. It was my longest flight ever in an F-14, strapped into an ejection seat, 7.2 hours. Oh my gosh, after you were about to Oh, this is nap. all night. We, we launched it uh, like eight at night. Yeah. I get back, this is now 2.30 in the morning. I'm actually coming in to refuel. I don't have enough yeah. fuel to get to the jet. I mean, back to the aircraft carrier. I literally am so tired and, and I can't focus. I can't get my refueling probe into the basket on the Air Force tanker. I was actually so dangerous with pilot-induced oscillations and flying over. He pulled his entire drogue unit up into the yeah. airplane and just said, no. And I said, listen, if you don't give me gas, I can't go back to the ship. I'll have to eject. Yeah. So reluctantly, he pulled it out. We got enough gas. I get back to the boat and... The first time I come into the boat, I get low. Just so you remember in the opening scene in Top Gun, he's all over the place, and you see the red lights everywhere, and they're yelling, wave off, wave Well, that happened. Yeah. And I didn't catch a wire, and I went back around. The second time, same thing. I literally could barely focus. And now the third time I'm coming around, we called, it was called trick-or-treat, which means you land on the boat, or you're going to have to go up and get gas again. And that third time, by the grace of God, I actually landed when I went to put my feet on the brakes, which are part of our rudder pedals, my legs, I had so much adrenaline, my legs were just shaking. And I literally could not get out of the airplane. Um, I had to have four people help me get out of the jet. And then I walked with one of my friends, so nobody noticed from upstairs, because they're looking down on yeah. the flight deck toward the hatch. Yeah. And didn't even go in debrief, I just went to my room. Yeah. So the guy in my back seat, uh, Greg, said, yeah, we're, he would never fly with me again. Because <laughs> they have no flight controls. He, I literally probably, he probably thought that we were going to die at least three or four times on that flight. And he, he also... Well, did he know how little sleep you had had? Oh, yeah, but he's, he's the same. He probably took a nap. I mean, he can't. He doesn't have any flight controls. We don't have an autopilot either. I, like, I, it's not like you know driving a Tesla and you put it on autopilot on the freeway or a Boeing right no yeah i had to be yeah. controlling yeah. it the whole time i think he was a little more rested than i was but yeah that's just one story but yeah and what was the cigar part of that story oh so yes good tie-in so i you know i lived yes which is good and my friends are like rammer 
that was really bad. So we're going to go just celebrate the fact that you're still here. So we snuck down at about 2 in the morning to the fantail, the aircraft carrier. Um, three officers sitting there on the fantail, and we light up cigars. Because, you know, we're hoping not, you know, all the breeze will blow yeah. it out the back. and yeah. You're not allowed to smoke on the ship. And we're sitting there just smoking big old stogies and just laughing and telling a joke. And all of a sudden we hear the, uh, the military police. Yeah. Who's back there? Right. They're all enlisted guys. We're officers, but they could arrest us. Yeah. So we, we, we flicked our cigars off the fantail into the wake yeah. and we ran and hid behind some hydraulic equipment. Yeah. And then they went over this way. And then, we, <laughs> then we went and hid behind some nets and then we made it, we made it back to our, we felt, I felt like some kid pulling a prank on like the girls dorm in college. Like I was <laughs> I kept running away, hopscotching. We all get back to our, our uh, state room and we're just cracking up and giggling like little girls because like we got away with smoking a cigar, but we didn't try it again. But that was the, that's all the cigars tied in. So John, your call sign was Rammer? Yes. How did you get that name, John? Just from my last name, Ramstead. Ramstead. I never did anything stupid enough or colorful enough other than that that I would tell you on a broadcast to get a different name. <laughs> so when, when did you get that name in the chronology of your career? Oh, I've been Navy? called, you know what? I've been called Rammer all the way. Flight school? Yeah, Rammer, Ramrod, all the way, you know, college, you know, high school, college. So it just kind of followed me. Now, yeah. you have such an illustrious career in the Navy. You were actually assigned, or how is that said, like assigned to Top Gun School. Mm-hmm. Yep. And how did that process occur? Oh, well, uh, that was interesting. So just another story of kind of reaching out for mentorship. We were actually going into the Persian Gulf for that first trip. Uh, Steve just got back from Australia. We were doing work with the Royal Australian Air Force in yeah. Darwin area. Okay. And we were doing um, self-escorted strike missions where we had to fight our way in air to air, do air to ground, drop bombs, and then fight our way back through yeah. Australian F-18s. And I sucked. Seriously, I kept, they kept uh, beating me. I was, remember, I was the most junior guy in the, in the squadron. So I went up to a guy. Um, Even though you graduated number one in the country when you graduated. True, but that's, I mean, think about this. You might graduate number one. You might be number one in, let's say, the, uh, the NFL draft. And you get to the NFL, it's a whole different level of play. Yeah. And you just never rally at that level. Yeah. Okay, seriously, like I felt like I had totally outkicked my coverage. I went to one of the guys in my squadron who nobody could beat, even guys F-18s, F-16s with better airplanes. And I went up to him, and it was kind of humbling because he was, wasn't the most approachable guy. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, listen, I would love for you to mentor me because I really need to get better. And he looks at me and goes, yep. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and I said, would you mentor me? He goes, nope but I'll fly with you. So we went up and did an engagement in, in six engagements. You start on neutral, right? You come right, you know, yeah. left to right at each other. Yeah. So you're perfectly neutral. Yeah. Within 30, maybe 40 seconds, he was behind me with a gun solution on the back of my head. Yeah. I'm like, what? He's like, his airplane defies the law of physics. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're flying back to the boat and I'm like dreading because we do all of our debriefs yeah. in public. Yeah. Like, you know, we're sitting here yeah. and like, imagine this is a writing room full of all, and everybody hears every conversation. I'm dreading this debrief with this guy. Yeah. He's going to tear me a new one. We sit down and he never once gave me any advice, told me what to do, or gave me even any feedback on what I did. He, this is because I'm a coach now. He started coaching me. Here's what he said. He said, Ramstead, when we came together at the merge, why did you go nose low behind my tails? I said, uh, it's my opening move. He's like, okay, then what? What did you think I was doing? Why did you go nose high here? Were you an afterburner? He deconstructed every single movement, what I was thinking, what I thought he was thinking, how I reacted and vice versa. Yeah. He made me pull out everything that I had learned and experienced and put in my head and actually apply it in my own brain so that it was mine. And at the end of just a couple months of a few flights with him, I remember it was a huge victory of mine because we actually went and did another, yeah. our final one. Yeah. I, we were neutral the whole time. He didn't get behind me, but I didn't get behind. I didn't kill him ever, <laughs> but he didn't get behind me. Yeah. And 
they saw, my commanding officer saw that improvement. The improvement. And he had been the former commanding officer at Top Gun, and he wanted to go up, and yeah. I actually beat him in a dogfight. Yeah. And what happens is you go to, actually, you go to Top Gun, and it's also, you go there to actually, it's really a train-the-trainer model. You actually go there to become the expert for the air wing on everything air combat. Then you come back and actually train all the pilots. You're part of the, then the operations group doing all the training for the pilot. Yep. Um, so it's only one person a year that gets to go. I get the orders to go. I'm walking out of my the skipper's stateroom like I'm on cloud nine. Like I never, I mean, like a year ago, I didn't even think I'd be able to survive in this environment. And then the next weekend, I'm playing softball, and then I hear, watch out! And I got hit with a line drive softball in the right eye, blew out the back of my eye socket, had nerve damage, and six months later, I'm out on the street, out of the Navy. So, you know... Sometimes life throws you significant curveballs. Yeah. Now think about this, right? That had been my whole identity, my life. It's how I defined myself, being a fighter pilot. And here I am. The only job I could get was selling cell phones. I'm knocking on doors, trying to find people that were at home to sell them a cell phone. And the sounds of my dreams are roaring over my head. And all I'm doing is looking out there going, that should be me. And I was mad at God. I was mad at the world. I was mad at, I was bitter. I mean, when you have no direction, you have no goals, you have no dreams, that's a hard place. Talk about just being depressed. Uh, I was, I'd been you know, married, married my sweetheart. Um, let's see, I guess we've been married six or seven years at this time. But here's what happened is, it's just amazing how God works. I would have never gone to a church at that point in my life. Never. If somebody invited me to anything that had anything to do with Christianity, I would have been like, I'm out. Mm-hmm. And I met a guy named Jeff Saavedra, who was a school teacher. And we just started having coffee. And he started helping me uh, figure out maybe what I'm good at. Help me maybe get a different job just have a place to kind of vent. He introduced me to a guy who'd mentored him who was an attorney and a guy that kind of mentored the two of them who was a doctor. And these three guys were amazing believers. I mean, just total kingdom warriors. And these guys, through connecting with me and getting to know me and Donna, and we got to know their wives and helped me get like some direction, that gave them, in my mind, permission to have influence on me. And it was those three men that led me to my faith in April of 1994. Mm. And I got to tell you, they changed the trajectory of my life. As a matter of fact, so what is that, 94? That's 25 years ago. Because Donna and I just went out to San Diego to meet with John and Angie, Jeff and Annette, and Clark couldn't come down. But all of us got together for dinner to just celebrate how their them taking their focus off themselves in their very busy lives to just help a guy 25 years ago who was this egotistical, negative, sarcastic jerk at the time and just loved on me Mm -hmm. is the reason that I'm still married, have amazing family, and I'm on this path just to celebrate that. So it's amazing. So God showed me in that moment the power that we have just bringing our faith out into the world. It's not about, church is an important place, I believe, to go get equipped, right? To learn, but then you have to bring it out into the world Monday through Friday through Saturday, and you got to live it out because those guys did and changed my life forever. Powerful. So they showed me the power. That was God setting everything up through the action I had, but setting everything up to show me the power that you have in partnership with the Father in the marketplace to have influence. Think about that. Those two guys, those three guys and their wives, have had a multi-generational influence because now through the platform we've built, we've literally been able to work and serve and speak to millions. And I don't know what I'd be doing had I not met them, maybe in a corporate job making a ton of money and having no impact in the world. You know, it's a beautiful key in all that is the fact that they took their eyes off themselves. Mm-hmm. That when you said that phrase, something really just struck me in my my heart when you said that of the fact that they, like you said, loved on a person that probably wasn't very lovable. Yeah, I was. You know, but yet I was, reached out yeah. to you and loved on you and cared about you, 
and took time out of their very busy schedules, which we all are, and sacrificed time and energy and mm -hmm. to invest in someone. Over years, this wasn't like, yeah. well, let's go meet for coffee a couple times and see if I can help you. Yeah. Like, no, like, and if they didn't hear from me, they'd call me up and say, hey, John, what's going on, man? Really holding you accountable. It's been a month, man, yeah. let's grab coffee. And I'm sure they even extended their reputation and their credibility to introduce you to people and such. And oh, 100%. Help, you know, and that's a risk too. Yeah. You know? I remember John Brenner, the attorney, because I had no sense of fashion at all. I was coming out of the Navy. Sure. Right? Grew up in a middle class house. He took me down to his clothier to buy my first suit. Wow. Spent the whole half a day with me. Incredible. And then taught me how to like take care of a suit and not don't dry clean it too often. And here's you make sure you hang it and and this is what you need, you know, in the business world. And here's wow. and here's how to go shop and find things at a deal at your price point. Because I, you know, it had very little money, but you need to look the part that you want to play. I mean, just I'll never yeah. forget that shopping yeah, trip yeah. with him. Yeah. It's interesting you had that yeah. because I, when I was a young guy, sales guy with Procter and Gamble. I had a female manager who went mm -hmm. to church with me, helped me get my job there at P and G, my first job out of college. And there was a, another sales manager who was a male, and I had bought this suit and everything like that. And you know, it was I could tell it was out of place because P and G had a Procter Gamble had a certain way of looking, you know. Yeah. And he actually he did the same thing. He took me out one day. He goes, "Hey, I want to ride with you," which meant he was going to ride with me to a few stores and watch me sell. So we did a few sales calls. And then he took me to a clothier too. He said, you're going to buy this suit and this is why. Because mm -hmm. these are the colors in our culture at Procter & Gamble. This is the ties that you need to buy right now. This is the shoe you need to buy. I was like, it was incredible. But as a young kid, 21 yeah. year old, I didn't know. Yeah. I had no clue. Yeah. So until you have someone to mentor you and take the time to do it, even down to the basics of that. Yeah. And you know that old friend, you know, you don't care how much somebody knows until you know how much they care. Right. You know, it's those little things. You know, people calling you up just to check in. Powerful, yeah. Uh, you know, it makes me think of right now, there's actually, uh, it's something I need to go do. It just popped into my head. There's a guy that was really struggling and, and left the Bible study that we were in. And I've reached out to him a few times, just trying to stay in touch. But I just thought in my head, you know what, it's been probably two months. And that's too long. Yeah. So I'm going to call him on the way, way up from here. Yeah. I think that's part of it too. I think God puts those little nudges in your heart, your spirit, mm -hmm. names, right, situations. And I think it's really important that even if you don't understand why, that you actually act on them. Because mm -hmm. that guy who I'm just thinking of, that could be nothing, or maybe it's the most important call he gets today. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. But I'm excited to give him a call on the way out of here. All right, so you're out of the Navy. You are being mentored by these guys. What's going on in your life? How are you changing? Are you starting to see any fruit looking back? What's that story when uh, Jesus looks at, was it the olive tree? And says, you know, it hasn't, you know, it's gonna get there. Uh, I'm trying to remember where that is. What I'm trying to say is, it was a long time coming. So I'm in a, ba I'm in a really bad place, but now I've gotten better. Right? Yeah. I found this faith. I'm totally yeah. excited. I get invited to church. The pastor of this church, Skyline Wesleyan, is this guy you might have heard of named John Maxwell. Yes. He was my pastor. It was awesome. I get a call from his assistant. He says, Pastor Maxwell, I'd like to meet with you. We meet for lunch. He insists I'm paying. I'm trying to be a big shot. He insists he wants to mentor me personally. And I don't want to be a parking lot attendant. So I'm like, thanks, Pastor. I'm going to pass. So my wife likes to remind me to this day that I could have been a contender. So, dude, so I had a long way to go. Kay, Kay's over here cracking up. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to mentor you, John. I'm like, yeah, thanks. I'm good. <laughs> you know, bada bing. You know, you. Yeah, I'd like a. So anyway, I move. A friend of mine calls, and uh, here was the next series of events. Like I'm like, okay, God's got me on this track. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to go get involved in the church because I'm going to get in business and be in, I'm going to be as successful as an entrepreneur as I was a fighter pilot. So I got hit by that softball. So I moved back to Minnesota and I'm in a bad place. I start a, uh, a company with my best friend. Remember the guy, Larry, who pulled me off the cliff yeah. with him. And uh, we drove that company into the ground and I ruined a friendship in the process. 
I was not ready. He, I don't think he was ready. And then the next job I got invited to be the head, a guy saw something in me I did not see in myself, to be head of sales and operations for a startup data mining software company. I worked 90 hours a week, grew that company to a million dollars a month in sales. Yeah. I was worth $12 million on paper. Don and I, because you guys both know my wife, man, we were already figuring out our future. Man, we had the golden parachute. Yeah. And then the internet bubble popped. And 90 days later, that company was gone. And I'm back on the street wow. again. And then I go to another tech company. Mm -hmm. And I'm working 90 hours a week again. And they want to promote me to run half of the country. Because one thing I always kind of my philosophy was, and it didn't serve me well, it served me well short term, but not long term, was I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'll outwork anybody around me. And I did that at the sacrifice of my relationship with my wife and my kids. Because I was an 80, 90 hour a week guy. And I knew that if I took this next promotion, I was going to be gone even more. I'd be traveling four to five days a week. Because I would have from Minnesota, the, the Mississippi River, all the way to the East Coast. Mm. I'd have that whole region. Mm -hmm. And there was an office in every state. And every state had a manager. And some states had multiple managers, like in Chicago. And so I quit. Now, had I stayed there a few more years, I don't know what my future would look like today. You never know in hindsight. I still, at that point, didn't know how to find some good advice and counsel on making some of these big decisions. That's something, when you're making a big decision... I would really encourage people to really find a lot of great godly men. You can't just say pray about it. For me, anyway, God has really used, when I really have connected with people that have a really strong, healthy relationship with the Lord, those are the people that have so God uses them to sow into me. That's how I think he speaks to me a lot, in addition to just scripture and prayer. But that's, you know, everybody's a little bit different, but... Anyway, that led me to Wall Street. So then I managed an office. They moved me to Denver in July of 2008. So a few months, <laughs> yeah, there's a theme here. <laughs> so a few months later, right, we had one of the biggest downturns in the world. Now here's the thing is my income during that period of time didn't go down and we grew the office. So I had taken all, I mean, there's so much more to unpack, but what I had learned about teams and relationships and, and making the important things important and focusing on the key things that we can control, right? And creating an extraordinary culture like we had back in a fighter squadron allowed me to really have a blast and have some amazing relationships with my team, in our organization, with our customers, with our vendors, with my family, but at that point, looking back on it now, I was still compensating, right? Because what had happened over this long period of time, like I remember I told you, like I was torn on fire with my relationship. Even though I didn't want to have Maxwell to pastor me, I mean mentor me, I still was all in on church and everything. But then as I did more and more bigger things in business, bigger titles, industry accolades, I started giving myself the credit. And I started kind of drifting away from that true north. Right, And so then I found myself in 2011 just unhappy, miserable, even though I was at the top of my game, right, running an organization, my income had never been higher, uh, dream house, dream car, all that kind of stuff. So I decided to leave and start another company with some good friends. And that was five months before you and I met. So when we met, it was a Family Talk donor event. I was working for Dr. Dobson at the time. We did this little donor event up in Great Falls, Montana at this ranch, this gorgeous ranch that was part owned by John, that it might, probably still is part owned by John Elway. Yeah. I think there was like 10 or 11 owners of the place. Gorgeous. And that first night, Doc had everyone kind of gather around and tell their stories just to kind of introduce themselves. And Doc even had me and Joe, the two Family Talk employees that were there, tell our stories. Mm -hmm. And I remember two guys in particular that were telling their stories that I was like, all right, 
I want to get to know them. Because Doc sent me out there for three reasons. One, to present any audio visual that needed to be presented. So I brought the iPad that had all the presentations on it, plugged it into the TV, and we'd, we'd do the presentations. Two, to record any interviews that could potentially be need to be recorded. And then three, to, inter- to interact with the people that were there and to put a face on the staff that worked for Family Talk. And there were, like I said, there were two guys there that really kind of caught my eye that were like, I really want to get to know them. And you were one. And so that first night after we got done telling our stories, we went over to the bar area and, you know, so Minnesota, all right, I'm from Wisconsin. And we kind of given each other grief about the Vikings and the Packers and the Gophers and the Badgers Mm -hmm. and just starting that little guy rivalry kind of stuff. And yeah, so the next day we were scheduled to go on this little horse trail ride to this little picnic area. Yeah, I'm like on the back of this big 20,000 acre land. Like on, evidently, it was supposed to be on some plateau for lunch, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you hop on your horse, and you don't look very comfortable on it. Well, and, yeah. And, and I ask you, I said, John, when was the last time you rode a horse? Oh, uh, 18, something like that. You know, trail rides, you know, the family, you know, the Boy Scout trips or things like that. Yeah, it's just a nice, easy trail ride is what it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And then your horse just all of a sudden takes off. Yeah, he. he uh, I was the first one saddled, and was, not everyone was saddled at the at this point. No, I was. I think at this point, I think, I think one or like, two other people were saddled. Doc was. Doc was, and, and maybe one other person. I think one or two other people were. So my my horse starts uh, trotting out into this big open area. All of a sudden, he just bolts and he takes off ninety degree turn. I'm laying flat on my back. Yeah. And his rump is slamming me in the shoulder blades. And I'm scared to death. I'm going to flip off the back of this horse and get kicked in the head and die. So I do the only thing that I can think of, and that's squeeze with my legs as hard as I can. And anybody out there who's listening who knows about horses knows that I'm telling them to go faster. Not only go faster, I'm squeezing so hard, go full afterburner. And he's like, roger that. He just launches now i finally get my weight back up in the saddle my right foot i'm in sneakers is out of the stirrup along my entire right side parallel to me is a big steel corral fence it goes down about 80 yards maybe i'd say yeah, about 80 80 90, yards and at the yards. very end of it is a whole series of paddocks that are right in front of me we're heading straight toward a whole series of paddocks that are all made with these big steel bars rolled steel roll this three inch fence. rolled steel corral fencing and it's clear to my left. So I reached down. So we're going faster and faster. I was really uncomfortable. I've never been on a horse. I, I mean, have you been on a horse at full gallop? Like, it's unnerving for me anyway. And so I grab the rein and I pull on the, the horse's rein to get him to turn to the left. And he pulls his head straight back. I was like, ruh row. He didn't turn. So I grab and I pull even harder. And he pulls his head back even harder. And he is now just going faster and faster and faster and the wind is in my hair and his hooves are thundering and I literally start panicking. I mean, my thoughts are just out of control. Like I had to jump off the horse. If I don't jump off the horse, I'm gonna break my neck. If I break my neck, I'm gonna die. Like I had been in, you know, I've been in combat. I've been shot at. I've raised three teenagers. (laughs) Nothing, nothing has prepared me for this moment. All of a sudden at a full gallop, this horse had not slowed down in a bit from my perspective heading straight for that heading straight fence. for that fence i mean like everything slows down and i remember th- having one that moment of clarity thinking this is not going to end well and that's the last thing i remember and uh it's been described to me i think steve watched it but i guess yeah. the horse went into the fence and dropped his butt and he bucked so hard he flipped over and when he did that he launched me head first into the steel corral fence so the top bar hit me across the face from my jaw, my teeth, all the way up to my left eye. I think probably what he was trying to do was buck you over the fence. But you're such a big dude that you just went right into that top rail. I went right into the top rail. And then, so I broke virtually every bone in my skull, except for my jaw and my right cheekbone. I broke my neck. C1, C2, right? Two and three. Two and three, yeah. I shattered my right shoulder. And they didn't even diagnose that for six months. Because there was so much nerve damage in my neck, they thought all everything in my shoulder was referred pain. So that wasn't even fixed surgically almost until a year after the accident. 
and then the uh, second bar down hit me in the chest and it broke, uh, crushed my left rib cage, broke all the ribs and punctured my left lung. And uh, just to put things in context, we, uh, I ended up spending five weeks in ICU and then 20 months here at Craig Hospital for a severe traumatic brain injury, had 23 surgeries over a two and a half year period. And we were told by multiple doctors three or four different doctors at different points along the journey that what happened was not medically survivable. I even had one guy reconnect with me, this was two years ago, mm -hmm. um, said that he'd been a combat doctor in Iraq. And what he saw there, just the evil that you see on the battlefield, you know General Boykin, right? I mean, the evil that's on a battlefield, he goes, there just cannot be a God. There's not a God in this place. And he completely walked away from his faith. But he was there at, in Montana when I came in and watch me from afar heal because he goes there's no explanation man or medicine that only can be god and just he said just by watching you it opened me to the fact that there is a, a god who loves us and through a third party led him back to his own faith because i woke up on the ground and i don't remember hitting the fans because like i said I'm, no. the memory's gone i think because of the brain damage to the front left lobe uh, my whole front left side of my skull was caved in. There's now eight titanium plates up there. I remember waking up on the ground into more pain than I can even describe. I mean, I was beyond my breaking point. You know that saying, God won't give you more than you can handle? It's not true. Mm -hmm. I was beyond that point. Literally freaking out, panicking. I guess I was screaming and yelling. This is all cut open. There's, I can feel people trying to hold me down. Yeah. And then all of a sudden... I'm in God's presence. And I remember being in his presence, the first thought I have, I'm not worthy of somebody loving me like this. It was like the fabric of the universe was this love and I got to touch it. And then I felt this peace washing over me, like almost like waves in an ocean coming in. It almost has a color to it. I almost want to say purple, but that's not right. But as this washed over me, all that pain and panic and fear was completely taken away. And you were right next to me when this happened. And how did you experience it? I was at your left shoulder. And so to take the listeners back from what I saw, you don't remember this, but instinctively you started pulling yourself up. So as soon as you hit the fence, I was about 10, 15 yards towards you away from my ATV. So I ran back to my ATV. I figured I'd get there faster zoomed on the ATV to get to you. And at that point that I'm getting there, you're starting to pull yourself up instinctively. I think because the lung was punctured, you had lost your breath and you were trying to catch your breath. And your body was like, we need to breathe, so I need to stand up, I need to get lungs, I need to get air in these lungs. And so I get there, and right around that time, a couple other guys started getting there and were like, and I'm telling you, John, you need to get down, your neck may be broken, John, you need to get down, your neck may be broken. And then at this point, I'm starting to like, okay, we need to get him down. So you two people go over here to your shoulders. We need someone at the head to get the head stabilized. I'll wrap up the legs because, John, you're a freaking big dude. I mean, you're what, 6'3", 235 pounds? Yeah. You're a big dude. And so at this point, then you just instinctively kind of went down on your own and kind of laid yourself down. All right, cool. He's down on the ground. So at this point, there was like, um, I think Lindsay was on your right shoulder. I was on your left shoulder. Steve Bray was kind of had your head braced so that way your head didn't move. That's when you started to feel the pain. And at that point, Steve Bray prayed this prayer that was, I literally felt the presence of God in a way I felt him I can tell you less than a dozen times in my entire life. I mean, it just came down and there was just peace. I know I felt it. I know Steve felt it. Lonnie, the ranch manager, didn't feel it. She thought you were going into shock and we were about to lose you. So she's kind of freaking out. We're trying to get the med flight out there to come pick you up. But at that point, you told us, what did you say? Well, what happened was, so I'm, I'm in there basking in his presence. Um, and as he takes away the pain, he speaks to me. And it's this voice like I've never heard before that came from everywhere and nowhere. And it wasn't to my ears. It was like a consciousness flowing through me. And what he said to me was, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. 
John, I'm going to heal you and use this for my glory. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, and, now in that, in that, there are two scriptures. Did you know those scriptures beforehand? No, I did not know that it was from Romans 8, 28. I really didn't. That's not where I was at. I was a churchgoer, but not a Bible reader or scholar. Yeah. And I didn't know the last part was from Job. Yeah. So I've studied both of those quite a bit, as you can imagine, <laughs> since then. And then um, as soon as he said, though, that last part from Job, I knew that my left eye was permanently blind. He gave me that knowledge because all the bones behind the eye socket had shattered and severed the optic nerve between my eye and my brain. And so my left eye to this day is completely blind. And then I, I opened my eyes and I said very calmly, because I was in no pain, I said, God's here, it's going to be okay, you don't have to worry. And Lonnie, who's holding my hand, who's a believer, who's also been a paramedic for 30 years and seen some horrible accidents up there, says, like she didn't, literally, she told me later, she didn't expect me to survive until the life flight helicopter got there because she knew it would probably take about an hour. She personally did not expect me to make it until the helicopter got there. And I just laid there for the next hour. I just remember not being in any pain, being a bit confused. Yeah. I, I, lost, I had eight teeth shattered. So I kept like, yeah. what the heck? Like, guys, what's wrong with my teeth? I think I kept repeating so, questions yeah, maybe. Yeah. I, think, so, so I don't the, think that's firsthand knowledge. I, I think I know you've actually shared that with me. Yeah, so the way I describe it in which you ask the same three or four questions in a row, but you would ask it and it would seem to be longer between when you would ask again. So you'd ask, 10, 15 seconds would go by, you'd ask again. 20 seconds would go by, you'd ask again. Like my brain was and, rebooting and that's, almost? That's, that's the way I've described it to you. It was almost like your brain was rebooting. And it was... <laughs> Talk about it, a hard it, reset. It was, it, was, it was starting to get almost <laughs> comical as it kept going on because we knew the questions you were going to ask in the order you were going to ask them. And, what what and, were and the we questions? Had, so, what happened so, to my teeth? Yeah, what happened to your... Oh, my tooth is chipped. And then one of them was about Donna. And then I don't remember what the other questions Investment were. Investment advice? Yeah, no, oh, it wasn't no. about... It wasn't anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> don't buy any wooden nickels because <laughs> i do remember though uh, because uh donna called or somebody called donna i think it was Lindsay, called my wife and because i was acting so normal they basically said donna you know your husband got thrown off a horse he's doing pretty good you need to get up here to montana at some point you know so you can you know drive him home i'd flown i had my own plane i flew my own plane up there my plane was sitting up there um i don't know if he knew that so i get to the hospital and they do a ct scan and so Dobson, Dr. Dobson calls my wife and says, Donna, hi, Dr. Dobson, you need to get up here and bring the boys as quick as you can. It does not look good. They didn't know if I would even survive as soon as they assessed me. And how'd you like to get that call? So Donna had the presence of mind to call one of my partners in the plane. They all flew up, Donna, my three boys, a good friend of mine, Norton Rainey, and the guy who could fly my plane back. And I got to tell you, like, God told me he was going to heal me, right? Yeah. So I'm texting guys from ICU. Like, hey, that meeting in two weeks, I'll be there. I'm good to go. Because <laughs> God's going to heal you. cancel it. That workshop we're doing, I'll be able to present. I'm all in. <laughs> Five <laughs> weeks later, I'm still in ICU. I'm like, what the heck? Lord, you said you're going to heal me. And I got to tell you, the pain that I was in... Oh. Yeah. All these surgeries. I mean, yeah. my skull was shattered, neck broken, shoulder, oh. rib cage. I mean, I had two brain surgeries. I had to take my entire skull off twice. I've had eight surgeries just on my neck. They've had to go in through my, through my jugular vein down into my heart to repair. I mean, I've had a complete reconstruction on my shoulder, facial. I mean, I could go on and on and on. So when God tells you he's going to heal you, and it's now two years later and you're laying in your hospital, in your bed at home, still, I mean, I had a severe traumatic brain injury. Yeah. Cognitively, I could not focus. I couldn't, you were, I mean, Steve would come up and visit quite a bit. I would word find. I couldn't, I'd use the wrong, you know, squirrel when I was trying to talk about a bucket. I mean, nothing made sense sometimes. I couldn't communicate. It, it just wasn't more. My memory was gone. Short-term memory gone. There's still stuff. I had somebody come up to me the other day who 
we I was in the middle of a negotiations with a big deal on right before the accident. And I don't remember him, um, the circumstances, his name, his voice. And I mean, there's just certain parts about my, my memory that are just, mm -hmm. at this point, they're just not there. So some people that meet me, they just have to be a little patient. But it's been hard. And you're laying in bed, recovering from yet another surgery. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, some of this was so intense, even though they gave me like oxycodone, you know, which was appropriate for where I was at. But it would literally dull the pain for about an hour. And you only could take it every four hours. Oh, wow. That last hour, I'll never forget it. Every day it was a ritual. I'd look at my clock. What is it now? It is 1140-ish. I'd look at the clock and say, okay, my goal is to get through 1145. That's my goal. That's it. Because God gave me this little ember of hope. He said, this is going to be used for my glory. And he's going to heal me. So I knew that there was a plan, but I didn't, I didn't want to be part of this plan anymore. And what happened, it was this weird place of tension between gratitude and anger hmm. because of the pain, because of, and I was afraid to admit that I was mad at God. So you combine anger at your circumstances with a brain injury where your emotional center is compromised. And how do you think you show up in the world? My kids would walk in. If I was in a room that had, I mean, this is a completely silent room. I had to be in a room like that. My brain literally couldn't process noise. They'd walk in being kids laughing and joking, maybe even bouncing a basketball on the floor. I would immediately start. My perception of that is they were trying to hurt me intentionally. That's kind of how warped some of my thinking was. And I would start screaming at them, swearing, calling them names. How dare they? I really hurt my relationship with my kids. And it was really hard for Donna. She went from being a stay-at-home mom living her dream as a mom, homeschooling our kids, doing work with you know charities in the church and her women's groups, to having to give all that up, to have to go back to work and also be my caregiver. Yeah. I know for a fact this was harder for her. But this is just how amazing how God works. So through this, though, I think he just saw some cracks in the foundation of the family that I had allowed to be there because of what, how I was doing things previously. And I'll never forget, I was actually listening to um, Henry Blackaby. He's talking about spiritual strongholds. And anger at God for life circumstances is one of them. And I started really reading the scripture about that, right? And God doesn't promise us any explanations for anything. Did God cause the accident? I don't believe he did. But it doesn't matter, Let's just, if we're going to be honest. If we're going to trust, we have to choose to trust God and his faithfulness or not. That is faith. That is true faith, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'll never forget, like I realized I was mad at God and he already knew it. So I got on my knees and just shared all that with him. And then I went to each one of my boys and I got on my knees and I asked for their forgiveness. Especially my middle son just started bawling and weeping as we just were in his room hugging it out. But that was that moment, that realization, that awareness that led to now complete and total restoration and redemption. I, my wife, my marriage has never been better. My relationship with each one of my boys is, is what I had always dreamed of before we even had kids. My oldest son works for me. My middle son, who's in, a, in college, who's in a fraternity, he's also a, a, he got a girl a pregnant in high school and kept, uh, so he's a, you know, he's a dad. We talk almost daily on the phone. And my youngest son, Matthew, was 16. I mean, he's just, he's still at home, but I mean, my life today is amazing. And had it not been for the action, I have no idea where I'd be today. I, I guarantee you, I wouldn't have relationships like this. I know exactly what I'd be doing right now. I'd be taking a breather because I was, I'd be going back down to the office for a job that I didn't like, but I felt that I had to be at because I didn't. I didn't realize back then that I had the power to rewrite my script. 
of my entire life. That's good. And when I was given that knowledge, I went and rewrote the script to my life. And I'm still writing it. And I got to tell you, man, it's been, I wouldn't change anything that's happened now for the world. My wife actually, for the first time in eight years since the accident, eight, wow. accident was eight years ago, she absolutely violently disagreed with that statement. She goes, no, if there's anything I do, I take back that, you getting on that horse. And she actually just said after this amazing trip we just had to New York and time with the family and everything going on, she goes, you know what? She goes, I don't think I'd trade what we have today for the world. Oh, wow. In hindsight, when you're in the middle of it, oh, yeah. when you're in the middle of adversity, I got to tell you, the thing, that, the thing that you need is just people to be there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, Steve, you come up and just, you know what? I hate it. I, I tell you what, just a little advice for people. Don't ask somebody who's going through crisis, whether it's cancer, a death in the family, an accident, how can I help you? Because I did not know how to answer that actually was stressful. Yeah. But if somebody just come up, Steve would just come up and hang out. He'd make fun of the Vikings. <laughs> Don't make me laugh, that hurts, right? <laughs> right? Uh, we had people come over and just say, hey, you know what? I'm sure you guys are, life's a mess right now. So we're gonna come over and clean your house this weekend and do all your laundry. They just told us, hey, we're gonna come over and you got all those people that are bringing meals to your house, which blew me away. Like People I didn't even know, I think we had three or 400 meals delivered to our house over those two years. It was crazy. I mean, people we don't even know. I'm like, I want to, how do we say thank you to all of them? But we had people that would come over and help organize that and organize things in the fridge based on when we got stuff and come over and put stuff in because Donna was with me at the hospital two years, 20 months. You know, people took care of our kids. The gratitude I have toward others and also the humility that I saw just in um, this heart that I saw in the world gave me so much hope. Because all the stuff that we see in the news and stuff, right? That's not what God sees when he looks down here. He, he's, he's got a huge smile because he sees the heart of people. And he's moving right now in a big way. And I believe what you're doing, Kay, what you're doing, Steve, why I am here is because he is calling right now. Actually, the, the trumpets are sounding for people to heed the call, to step up and get on the field because there is something big happening right now and he needs leaders and workers for not only a harvest, but I think a complete revival, a movement. I don't know exactly what it is, but I can feel it's in the beginning. I think you've felt that too for a while too, haven't you, Steve? Yeah. So now, after this, you obviously stepped down as a financial advisor. Yes. You could only work about 20 hours a week. No, when that, I first started, that, I literally could work eight hours a week. Literally one or two hours a day max. Then I had to go back and be in a quiet room. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'll never forget, I was sitting there, it was just two and a half years after the accident. Uh, so I guess about what, five years ago. Sitting in my bed, recovering from yet another surgery, and I'm like, I don't know what I want, I'm going to do. I can't go be a CEO of a company. I can't put in the hours to do any kind of traditional job. Like, what's next? And I'm sitting there praying, and I hear God speak to me. Um, he said, God, John, I want you to use this life I've given you to equip and inspire leaders to work in my kingdom. I'm like, awesome. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, where's page two? Can you, like, you know, where's the manual on that? Well, yeah, that was yeah. on this. That's on a Saturday, but now on a Monday, I go meet with a friend of mine who's the CEO of a company. He goes, John, man, I'm so struggling with my business, my marriage, my kids, the stuff I want to do in the community, my you know, faith and philanthropy, and whatever I focus on does well, and the other one's just language. He goes, I feel like, like I have these three pillars, and I can almost pull them all together, but I'm not quite there. He goes, I'm going to hire a coach to help me do that. And he goes, if you ever decide to be a coach, I'll be your first client. I'm like, dude, that's awesome. What's a coach? <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> and I guarantee you there are people listening right now that they don't know. So explain what a coach is. A coach is somebody, think about what that guy did in the Navy for me, come alongside. He didn't give me any advice. It's not a, he's not a consultant. He's not a mentor. He's actually somebody there who has really good insight and context to ask the questions that you need to answer that you've probably never been asked. To pull 
from deep inside you learning and awareness and ownership on how you think, how you show up, what you do and why you do it to make the changes necessary to get the outcomes that you want, whether it's in your relationship, your marriage, your business. I coach three of my clients are executives of some of the biggest companies in the country. I coach uh, the leadership team of a nonprofit, I coach a pastor, I mean, I coach people across the spectrum. Uh, I've just had some transformational results. And I just love now that God put me in a, in a role of, I think in the past, Steve, I wanted to kind of be the king, right? Be known in the community, have my name out there, have that title, the recognition. Yeah, I mean, you, you were on a fast track to eventually move to Washington. Politics, In yep. politics. I mean, you, you had started the Colorado Family and Faith Coalition. Colorado Faith and Freedom Coalition. Faith and Freedom Coalition. Reed. That's how I actually met, uh, got to meet Dobson because uh, it was yeah. when he went down to vet Rick Perry when he was going to run for president. Yeah. When I went down to Texas for that whole yeah. trip. Yeah. So, yeah, that was my, my goal was to be a congressman, then a senator. And I had it all lined up to give it a go anyway. I felt like that's where I was You had go. some big donors that were behind you that had basically said, you have the pedigree, we like you, we like your yep. stances, we're going to basically bankroll you or at Correct. least be a big part of Yeah, so that's where you. I was heading. Yeah. So, But then I said, you know what, that's not my role. I want to step in the background. Mm. I want to be the king maker. And I got to tell you, I get so much joy right now helping. I got a, a guy that worked for a company in a cubicle who's left that company, who started a company now on the East Coast. He was a client of mine that's having an impact. He now has hundreds of clients. His company's called Greenhouse Culture. He's going in helping traditional secular companies create a kingdom honoring culture. Hmm. And they're having transformational results in the lives and the businesses and the profit margins of the, his company. And I got to be a little part of helping him figure out how to make, to create the bridge and then walk across the bridge to start that. And I'm so proud of him. And that's just one of, that's what I get to do now every day. And through that, I, so I started coaching. I speak now all over the country on both uh, what I call stained glass issues about our faith, adversity, hope, creating a kingdom business, and also what I call plain glass topics, right? I've had to learn how to take all everything that's been through my experience and translate it in a way that I can bring it out into the world in a way that creates something yeah. attractive and doesn't push people away. Yeah. Because in a lot of places, the word Christian or Christianity is a brand that really has a lot of problems. Jesus does not have a problem. Yeah. If you ask somebody, what's your opinion of Jesus? Well, he, the dude's often. What's awesome? What's your opinion of Christians? Yeah, not so much. Right? Even my son. My son got a girl pregnant, was in a Christian high school because they chose life and didn't have an abortion, yet they broke the honor code. They were expelled. Walked off campus, not allowed back on. Couldn't go to senior day, couldn't go to prom, couldn't walk at graduation. Because he chose to keep a baby that they, right? They made a mistake. They made a mistake, but they wanted to do all the right things. Yeah. So my son feels that me and my, his mom are the exceptions to what Christians are. Because that's his experience. Mm. So there's a lot we have to overcome. But the good thing is we have, we're in partnership with the father on doing it. And it is changing. But anyway. So five years ago. You reached out to me, actually about five and a half years ago, you reached out to me and said, hey, I'm thinking about starting a podcast. And I said, hey, I'm thinking about starting a podcast too. And we kind of compared notes and the Eternal Leadership Podcast was born. Yeah, now we have... 300 plus episodes that are up, I 300 believe. 300 plus episodes, almost 700,000 downloads total, 172 countries. A lot of those countries are, it's really cool. It's, they're non-Christian countries. They're Muslim countries. Yeah. At one, at one point, uh, the, the number seven downloaded in our first year, the number seven country that downloaded us was the Islamic Republic of Iran. Yep. And they're still in our top 20. Yeah. There's been some other companies. But Lebanon, Singapore, Indonesia, places like that. Because what we do in internal leadership is, right, it's all about how do we equip and inspire people to accomplish what God has inspired in them, right? So we talk about everything from spiritual growth to how to be a better 
husband, father, wife, mother, and then also in business, the business skills, because that's a big focus of what we want to do. And that has just been amazing. The people we've got to meet yeah. through that. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a blast. So, and you also have a book coming out. I do. I, I just got picked up by one of the biggest publishers in the country, which is total God thing. So my book, uh, it's called Breaking Through, Leading on Purpose with a Purpose. It's really about my entire, my whole journey and all the principles I found to really connect. Here's kind of my whole philosophy is being in leadership my whole life. Yeah. Looking at the whole industry, I really feel like the industry focuses on the why, the what, and the how. The leadership industry. The whole leadership about. industry does. Yeah. And just in America last year, yeah. we spent $24 billion on leadership training just in the U.S. And if you go to Amazon and just type in the word leadership, you'll have over 30,000 titles that come up. Yeah. And does anybody other think we have a leadership crisis? Because here's what we miss, and I think the leadership industry is completely broken because they deliver what they can get paid for. And that is the one missing element, because I can go take your best stuff, both of you guys, and I can go apply it and not get a fraction of your results unless I work on who I am. Yeah. And that's what's missing. And it's all about our identity and understanding how to become our best self and then operating from that place. Because if we can do that for ourselves, we can do that for others, we can do that for people on our team, and we can change not only just families and organizations, but I believe cities and communities through that. So that is a movement that we are creating in this whole entire leadership realm. So, Well, I'm excited. But that's, the what the book. Book, that's what the book is all about. So it's going to be one. It's my first book. Yeah. I already got a couple more that I'm thinking of. And you're estimating March, April, May. I hope so. The yeah, the, it gets back. Actually, it's kind of been a fun process. I, you know, wrote the book over six months. <laughs> now it's in an editor, professional editor to go through. That takes about six weeks. And then it goes to the publisher and that takes three to four months. So I'm learning all this new stuff, right? You got to design the cover and the marketing. But with this big publisher, it's going to be in Barnes and Noble, in Books a Million, in Amazon. Of course, everything's on Amazon, but it's actually going to be in all the bookstores. Yeah. So... Yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. Well, when that book comes out, we will have you back on oh, to I'd talk to. about the principles and uh, we'll have another cigar. Deal. Over that one. Deal. So, John Ramstead, Kay Hidamine, thanks for being on. Let's get to rapid fire questions. Okay. Hey, everyone. Before we get to John's rapid fire segment, I want to talk about today's sponsor, Blinkist. When you factor all the hours it takes to read a single book, it's really an investment, or maybe you listen to audiobooks. Even at 1.5 speed, that's a commitment. I downloaded Bonhoeffer by Eric Metaxas on Audible, and that one's almost a 23 hour long book. Well, I'm a big fan of a book summary service called Blinkist. Blinkist has a library of more than 2,500 of the top books on the market. Most of them can be read in less than 15 minutes. Imagine taking all the key thoughts and stories of a book and distilling it down into a 15 minute read. That's what Blinkist does. Whether you're interested in leadership, marketing, entrepreneurship, personal development, sales, management, motivation, psychology, economics, finance, self-help, even marriage, parenting, history, and more, Blinkist has something for you. If you click on the link in the show notes or go to holysmokes.club slash blink, that's holysmokes.club slash blink. You can try them for a seven day free trial. And if you subscribe by clicking that affiliate link, it's a way to get a great service and help support the costs of editing and hosting this podcast. So go to holysmokes.club slash blink to check out Blinkist. Now for John Ramstead's rapid fire segment. Rapid fire. Fire. <laughs> all right, cigars or pipe? Cigars, although. Although? My son just said, Dad, we need to get pipes because pipes are awesome. So I might have to get a pipe in the next week. All right. Uh, they do smell good. My dad smoked one growing up. I always love the smell of a pipe. Yeah, my wife loves pipe. All right, favorite cigar that you like to smoke? You know, I've had so many good cigars. I would actually say... Anytime I'm smoking a cigar with friends and having great conversation, in that moment, that's my favorite. How's that? Does that work? As, as someone who was almost a politician, that's a very politician answer. <laughs> I'm about to cry. <laughs> oh, wait. oh, the tears coming. Oh, oh man. My, you, you touched every Holy Smokes heart out there. 
<laughs> I love you, Kay. That's not just the beer talking. I love it. <laughs> Favorite liquid pairing with your smoke? It's hard to find. It's very rare. Van Winkle bourbon. Van Winkle bourbon. I've had it once. Okay. Life changing. <laughs> yep. And I just bought a bottle for a friend of mine that retired from the Navy SEALs after 27 yes. years. That wasn't cheap. All right. We do do some non-cigar tobacco drink questions. Marvel or DC? Easy. Marvel. All right. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Favorite food? Steak. If you could be any animal, what would you be? Eagle. Dogs, cats, neither, or both? Dogs. Nickname growing up in college, Rammer, I would Rammer. assume. Yeah, all the ones I won't mention. <laughs> <laughs> What's one unusual fact that few people know about you? Oh, that I play concert violin. Oh. Favorite book? Not named the Holy Bible. You know, a fantastic book I've read recently is A Higher Call. Mm. It's actually a historical book about World War II, mm. about the Luftwaffe versus... Amazing story. If you guys want an amazing book, read... What's that? The RAF. Yeah, it's about... It's a, this guy Here's this story about an American bomber crew that was saved by a Luftwaffe Messerschmitt pilot. He's like, this can't be true. And he tracked it down and actually found both parties and how their li- what happened in their life that got to the point where this German pilot couldn't take another life. It was amazing. Amazing book. And I think a- another book that I reread every year uh, more on the, kind of the leadership area is called uh, Leadership and Self-Deception, which is a book that I reread in January of mm. every year. It's a phenomenal book. Because mm. we were just talking about who you are in leadership. This really helps you to understand, I think, that what happens is, right, there's a narrative, there's a whole separate set of facts, whether it's with your wife or somebody in business, and we start telling ourselves a narrative based on the facts. Mm. What if that narrative we're telling ourselves is false? Because that informs how we react, the decisions that we make. And so it's an incredible book on actually how to understand whether we're being truthful or we've deceived ourselves because of our own motives. Mm. Incredible. Yeah, it's kind of a slap in the, the face. Book? Leadership and Self-Deception. It's a book I reread every year along with How to Win Friends and Influence People. Good old Zig. Yep. All right. If you were arrested with no explanation, what would your friends or family assume you had done? Oh, that I had a brain injury and somebody gave me some bourbon. You're going to get arrested for that? (laughs) (laughs) And you're drinking Pappy. I was drinking Pappy and having cigars with strangers. (laughs) You're going to get arrested for that, all you right? You can't explain that, why that, I'm in my boxers, though, can that, you? That, 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 may, <laughs> that may happen this afternoon. <laughs> all right, final two questions. If you were to have a holy smoke with anyone throughout history, living or deceased, three people, who would they be? Can't name Jesus. First one. Yes. Because I was just in England and went on the tour and saw Churchill's secret underground where he oh, ran the war. Yes. Yeah. If I could have an evening and, and just have a cigar with Churchill and just hear the guy, his wisdom. Yeah. Another one uh, that's on the tip of everybody's tongue is Benaniah. And one of David's mighty men. From the Old Testament, all it says is the guy was coming back from battle. He was a man of valor. He fell into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion with his bare hands. And we're in the lion's den. And I see these, look at, you're looking at these pictures of lions all over here. Yeah. Imagine somebody that could kill a lion with his bare hands. I want to have a cigar with that guy. Say, yo, dude, what's up, man? Like, are you on a keto diet? Like, are you pumping? Paleo, you know, what? Paleo, like, what's going on? <laughs> what's up? No, I would love to know, like, how a guy like him thinks yeah. yeah his understanding of who god is i mean that something like that is on a mission it's the first um, ben and I, uh, yeah ben and I, uh, churchill you know who else would be amazing mm. uh that i would love to have a cigar with would be george washington ah. mm. that guy i think is so much deeper and more complex and more intelligent than if you actually really oh study what happened that led up to us winning that war. That, that, 
he's one of the most remarkable people I think that's ever lived. Yeah, I'm just wrapping up a, a Frederick Douglass mm-hmm. biography. Right after that, I, in mm-hmm. my queue, I have an Eisenhower biography, and I'm in line for the audiobook and audiobook about Washington. And uh, when I get that in 2020, I will be devouring that yeah, one. Me too. You know, it's just amazing leadership example of Washington. So here he is. He led us to victory in the Revolutionary War. Definitely among stature of leaders amongst leaders. I mean, look at the whole Congress. And then them clamoring for him to be the monarch. I mean, he could have become king. He refused. And he refused. He went back to, uh, what's his estate called? Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon. Vernon. Just the, the humility and the soberness. And then I think also his many ways his his prescient knowledge of the future of our nation of what he was building and what he had oh, literally yeah. sacrificed so many men for yeah. in his own life yeah and what all these men and women had sacrificed for for the founding of our nation and the trajectory that it would have taken if it became a monarch a monarch monarchy right versus a what we call now a republic we're really not a democracy we're a republic yeah and so it's just amazing to me like you i totally agree not only what led up to this victory but also the choices he made afterwards it says so much about his character yeah his leader and his faith but also oh. like we went we were in dc and we went to the spy museum oh, yeah. which was fascinating cool place do you know who started modern spycraft he did george washington the reason he won the war is because as things were developing he saw the need think about it the foresight that he had and he de- started developing all that before they even needed it and it was the key to winning yeah was intelligence i mean the the de- brian Kilmeade, i uh wrote a whole book about it which right. was fascinating yeah uh but anyway yeah all right last question if we were to meet one year from today and i got a bottle of champagne mm. how about a bottle of pappy or a bottle of pappy or a bottle of your bourbon that you had said that i that's the pappy van winkle van winkle yeah Happy Van Winkle. Yeah, Very nice. Good. Have you ever tried the Weller? The no. Weller is about 80% of the profile of a Pappy Van Winkle right. at a fraction of the cost. All right. I'll put it on my list. Definitely. So a year from now. Okay. So we're going into January. What are we celebrating? Here's what we're celebrating. My goal this in the next two years is to have an impact on a million people in this world and create a movement and change how leadership is done that we can do good through doing business now to measure that i'm doing a lot more public speaking so i would have done 30 keynote speeches across the country across europe um i have probably worked with about 30 clients small to medium-sized businesses those are the people that really need i think some work on leadership their culture, their people. Right now, the pace of change is accelerating rapidly. Most companies do not how, know how to create a company, a culture, and the people that can actually adapt to that, and they're gonna get left behind. And I don't want that to happen, because I wanna work with purpose-driven companies. I think the other thing, too, is our book uh, is coming out. I see that as kind of a driver of all that we're doing. And uh, also, we're doing, uh, we've been named the preferred leadership trainer for the U.S. Air Force. That is uh, part of our business that has been growing pretty significantly. And then I would like to see that part of our business double in the next year. The name of the business is Beyond Influence? Beyond Influence Influence is our company. Beyondinfluence.com is the website. Everything about our coaching, training, speaking, everything, I'm sure it'll be there in the the show show notes. notes. But also, I also keep... uh, People have been so generous with me. I keep appointments in my calendar every week just to talk to anybody about anything that I could be, if I could possibly be useful. So if you want to reach out and just schedule time to just chat about life, business, resiliency, any questions, whatever, for you. Um, I will be available. All right. Beyondinfluence.com is the website. Eternal Leadership is the podcast. John Ramstead. I love you, my man. You are one of the, the most special people in my life. Love you too, man. One of my closest friends. And uh, thanks for being on the Holy Smokes Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Sean. <laughs>